Looking for accountability and lasting peace in Palestine. In the U.S., witnesses testify in a lawsuit against the Biden administration for supporting Israel's war on Gaza. Could Washington be liable for complicity under the Genocide Convention? We'll talk to a plaintiff and a lawyer in the case. Also on the program, could a one-state solution end the Israel-Palestine conflict? Dismissed by most, author Anthony Lowenstein explains why he thinks a single secular state could still work in his book, After Zionism. I'm Andrea Sankey, and this is The Newsmakers. In most all cases, it's an uphill battle to hold anyone accountable for war crimes. But in Oakland, California, human rights groups, Palestinian Americans, and Gazans are taking a novel approach and suing the Biden administration for failure to prevent genocide. The hearing got underway on Friday just after the International Court of Justice ruled it plausible that Israel has committed genocide in Gaza, where one out of every 100 people has now been killed since October 7th. So while there is evidence, the U.S. court itself seems unsure of its own jurisdiction. Here's a look now at the case. Today is a historic day. Right here in Oakland, in the federal court, the Center for Constitutional Rights and Mark Vanderhout have brought a case on behalf of Palestinians right here in the United States and Palestinians in Gaza, charging the Biden administration Hundreds gathered outside the court in California for the first hearing of the case against U.S. President Joe Biden, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. In November last year, lawyers for Palestinian human rights organizations, Gaza residents, and Palestinian Americans sued the U.S. officials for failing to prevent unfolding genocide in the besieged Strip. They say the Biden administration is complicit in Israel's crimes. Three hour long testimonies reiterated the grave suffering Israel's war on Gaza has created. One of the plaintiffs, Dr. Omar al Najjar, joined the hearing remotely from a hospital in Rafah, where he is working in the intensive care unit. An Israeli bombing killed several members of Najjar's family, and he has been displaced four times. Najjar told the court he has lost everything. I have nothing left but my grief, uh, a lifeless body walking uh, in this earth, seeing the life uh, in shades of the gray, devoid of passion and energy. Um, this is what uh, Israel and its supporters have uh, done to us. Government representatives did not challenge the genocide accusations, but Justice Department attorney Jean Lin argued the court has no jurisdiction over the case and the U.S.'s support of Israel is a foreign policy matter. Yet, lawyers for the plaintiffs said this case is not a matter of policy, but of law. Here, the question is a legal one, whether the actions undertaken by the United States fail to uphold the obligation to prevent genocide. And that is an active obligation that requires that the United States not provide the means by which a genocide is being furthered. Federal Judge Jeffrey White described the testimonies as horrific and gut-wrenching. He also said it is one of the most difficult cases the court has ever had. Now the judge will decide on whether he has jurisdiction. Taking the U.S. to court just hours after the International Court of Justice ordered Israel to prevent genocide in Gaza, the plaintiffs are optimistic about the outcome. The whole world is demanding that Israel stop and that the U.S. stop supporting it. And now there is one man, Judge White, who can make that happen. And we are hopeful that he will do the right thing. Yet it will be very difficult to force the U.S. to halt its support and billions of dollars in military aid to Israel. But the outcome of the case can be a consolation for the plaintiffs who have lost loved ones in Israel's gruesome attacks. Well, joining me now to discuss the case further, 
are from San Francisco, Palestinian-American plaintiff Monadal Hartzala, and from New York, case attorney with the Center for Constitutional Rights, Diala Shamas. Thanks both so much for being with me. Monadal, you were actually able to testify, and you actually also heard, of course, the testimony of your fellow witnesses. I just need to ask you how you're feeling about uh, the case now being officially underway and what you heard and what you were finally able to say before a court. I, uh, I feel that uh, we, are, we have uh, taken a step in the right direction for the fact that we, uh, just, we testified about the situation that our families are going through, for the fact that they've been denied uh, necessities of life, uh, water, uh, electricity, everything that a normal life that requires for any human being. And I feel that uh, we have been heard by the court and we are waiting for the decision by the court to see where our demands are uh, being met. Mm. But personally for you, did it feel a bit cathartic to finally be able to say uh, in front of legal authorities uh, what's been happening? <laughs> We've been uh, able to uh, share with the, with the court and the public about the situation of my family as one of the families that have been subject to this vicious attack and uh, that we are uh, continuing to be targeted by the Israeli aggression, mm. supported by the U.S. government. And I have uh, lost myself, uh, seven members of my family, most of the plaintiffs have lost, as we are uh, testifying in court, we okay. have lost families in, in Gaza. It's, it's horrifying. But uh, Diala, let me turn to you now, because now the big question is whether this court actually has jurisdiction. Many legal analysts are saying this case actually can't be successful because they don't have judicial authority over U.S. foreign policy. Can you overcome that? We believe that absolutely we can. Um, that was the leading argument that the government put forward, the defendants put forward, um, essentially saying that this court, no matter how serious the legal questions are, um, has simply no ability to look into the matter, you know, by, by invoking something called the political question doctrine in U.S. law. Um, but as our lawyer responded, this is clearly a justiciable question. There are uh, these are the kinds of questions that courts regularly look into. It's a legal question of whether or not a genocide here is unfolding, mm -hmm. um, and more importantly, at this stage, um, uh, you know, Munada noted the testimonies, uh, the the task before the plaintiffs just for this stage uh, is to seek a preliminary injunction. We met our task of showing that we have a likelihood of success on the merits and significantly and why everybody testified, mm. the harms were so significant that it merits urgent action now pending the you know resolution of the proceedings in a longer term. Okay, so I mean, how long could this take then before, first of all, the jurisdiction question is actually decided? And, and I have to ask why that wasn't decided before. Why waste this time now just to say, oh, we don't actually have jurisdiction to make any real legal decisions in the first place? Um, we sought the preliminary injunction. So we filed our complaint. And then a couple of days later, we also filed a motion for a preliminary injunction. And at that stage, essentially what you're telling the court, which is similar to what occurred at the International Criminal uh, Court of Justice, uh, you know, earlier, mm. is this, this argument that unless the court intervenes urgently, it'll be too late because what is the point of trying to preserve rights if by the time that you reach the resolution, which could take years, the rights are already gone, the genocide will have already been Understood. completed. And so the jurisdictional questions will necessarily come into play at this early stage because the judge has to look in a sort of um, uh, condensed manner at, 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 it's not a full merit stage uh, hearing, but the judge does need to make sure that 
his court has jurisdiction, and we right. certainly feel that he does. Do you worry, though, that there will be, you know, somewhat valid arguments made that if they allow this court jur jurisdiction over this question, then they're going to have, for example, Yemeni Americans able to sue for their relatives being killed in U.S. airstrikes, you know, backing Saudi Arabian airstrikes. We also, we saw, you know, a judgment come down on the use of uh, U.S. weapons uh, in Saudi Arabia killing innocent uh, Yemeni civilians. So it, there's a whole can of worms, so to speak, that could be opened. And do you fear that the court might just want to stay away from it and kind of push it over to, oh, again, this is about foreign policy. We can't be involved in this. Yeah, so it would be a fact by fact, situation by situation assessment for all of those other examples, certainly. And that kind of slippery slope or floodgates argument is certainly the one that the government would be making, um, essentially trying to, to to scare the court away from um, doing exactly what a court is supposed to do, you know, under the U.S. system with the separation of powers, mm. the judicial checks the government when there is unlawful action, and here. The, the law that we're appealing to is clear. It's the, the, under the Genocide Convention, it's international law and the prohibition on complicity in genocide and failure in a duty to prevent genocide. Okay. Given the clarity of the facts, the huge, the magnitude of the harms and um, the justiciability of the question, the clear legal standards that exist currently for a court to apply, we don't think that it presents the same sorts of thorny issues as something that is more uh, in the realm of discretion or, you know, squarely in foreign policy. Right. Interesting. Okay. Monada, let me come back to you because you heard the, the ICJ ruling that was mentioned. It was, it was issued just a few hours, actually, before your case got underway. Did that help you feel empowered, in a sense, knowing that the International Court of Justice has said it's quite plausible that Israel is committing genocide here? Yeah, I, it, it made me feel uh, comfortable for the fact that I think also that uh, decision uh, was a step, a giant step in the right direction. However, I believe we're very honored to have a, a really great uh, legal team that we have. But aside, I wanted to make sure that aside from the technicalities and the court, the fact that our people is, be, is being slaughtered as we speak makes it significant. And quoting the judge in the court, when he's saying this is one of the most difficult uh, case, it really applies the fact that uh, Palestinian, uh, you know, like U.S. citizens who are backed up in, in, uh, as Palestinians uh, is being treated just like any U.S. citizen. Mm. It's not like we have, uh, is, uh, uh, you know, we are, our background is Palestinians are uh, being treated different than, uh, than a U.S. citizen who just became an Israeli citizen. We, we want to make sure that, that the Israeli government becomes uh, uh, subject and have the consequences of them uh, violating the international law. Yeah. They, can no, they can no longer be exempted from violating international law. And that's what the significance about the, uh, the ICJ. Uh... Right. Do you feel, Monad, though, I mean, many have pointed out there's, you know, this, again, the sense of hypocrisy that the U.S. is always happy to go after others and, you know, including Vladimir Putin's actions in Ukraine. That should all be, have, they should have to adhere to international laws in that case. Yet, when it comes to the United States and its complicity in this, suddenly there should be no accountability. Well, there should be, we will continue to work on that. However, our work in the court uh, is one aspect of our work. I'm also uh, active in my community, and I truly believe that our demands is being heard among uh, Americans in the streets, okay, in the in the colleges, in the in the unions, and therefore we are we are witnessing a growth in the change of this. It's really extremely important that uh, we members of Congress has has adopted you know, cease, uh, uh, the ceasefire. The Biden administration should take immediate action to do that. We have U.S. state and federal representative being ch changing in their in their position. We have U.S. municipality, meaning like city councils and uh, student organizations. All these give us hope that this uh, this uh, current U.S. position 
uh, supporting uh, the state of Israel as they are doing these violations is going to become a liability and not an asset to the U.S. So it's to their benefit, to the American citizen, as we are part of this, uh, this world, we see that all this funding mm. is being tied from social programs and going to a, a, a losing project uh, as they are supporting the apartheid state of Israel. Okay. Uh, Diela, final question for you then, twofold here. <laughs> if, if you win, what example does it set? And if you lose, what example does it set? I think if we win, most importantly, we would have the urgent relief that we're seeking, which is um, a stop of U.S. support to um, Israel's unfolding genocide, which could include directly ordering that the specific weapons that are being dropped on on civilians, um, the 2,000 ton bombs, for example, uh, are no longer transferred. And so there's a concrete material impact. And it also sets uh, a really important uh, tone <laughs> that this uh, current status quo of complete unaccountability, complete carte blanche that we are giving to Israel is no longer something that the courts will allow. And it's certainly already, frankly, a tone that is being set given the amount of attention and scrutiny that not only the public, but also the court is going to be looking into and frankly, members within the own, you know, political branches in the Democratic Party are also starting to be really concerned. So this is one among the many pieces that is intending to send that signal of, um, you know, severe public concern and interest in, in this question. Okay. Um, yeah, and if we lose, unfortunately, that would be a, 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 a blow, and I would be concerned about the state of the political question doctrine essentially rendering everything unreviewable, mm. um, including such clear violations of the law. But we also understand that this is one tool among several, and we know that our partners and our allies will continue fighting on all of those other Okay. Diela. Diela Shamas, that will have to be the final word. Uh, I'd like to thank you and Monad al Harzala for joining me so much on this segment of the Newsmakers. Great to have you both. Now, as Israel's assault on Gaza continues, the debate has resumed over where a political solution really lies. And again, the U.S. and the EU have stressed that a two-state solution is the only way forward. But Israeli leaders have now made it clear that won't happen. So given the status quo of occupation cannot be maintained, should a one-state solution be considered? It's been rejected before, but in a new publication, editor Anthony Lowenstein and his contemporaries argue why one state would be the best way forward. Anthony joins me now to talk more about after Zionism, one state for Israel and Palestine. Anthony, thanks so much for being with me. You actually thanks published this book uh, more than 10 years ago now, and you're yeah. re-releasing it at this time with some added kind of contemporary perspective. First of all, why launch it again? So the book came out 10 years ago, a bit more than that actually, and my co-editor is a Palestinian-American called Ahmed Moore. So the idea initially was to have a Jewish, Australian, German, myself, and a Palestinian-American Ahmed to think about ideas beyond the so-called two-state solution. And the reason we wanted to re-release it now is that although this has been the case for years, particularly since October 7, really a matter of days after the Hamas attack, you had President Biden and others talking about the only way forward here is a two-state solution, whereas the reality on the ground, having lived there for years, spent time there, Ahmed is, was born in Gaza, has had family killed in Gaza since October 7, there is no feasible prospect, putting aside even the Israeli government's ambition for a two-state solution, but this is what we call the zombie solution. It keeps on coming up every few months, every few years, and at some point, it's actually an excuse for inaction. And we believe, the publishers and Ahmed and myself, that now was the time to actually put forward on the table different ideas. We are not blind idealists. We are under no illusion about the incredibly painful and difficult position Israel Palestine's currently in. Roughly 30,000 Palestinians killed. Israel obviously is currently at war. It is a horrific situation. So, one state solution mm. doesn't suddenly appear tomorrow. But until we actually excise the possibility of two states, which is unjust for, frankly, Palestinians under occupation for decades, 
and imagine in a practical sense what one state will look like, then we're getting nowhere. Right. Uh, but uh, this is what, you know, confuses people, Anthony, is that um, a lot of Palestinians still want their own independent state. And then you have to, would have to ask anyway, how would, how would a one-state government actually work, especially when you're looking around the world and seeing states like the United Kingdom, where, you know, there's the Scottish Nationalist Party that wants out of that union. And there's no history of genocide or, or you know, war or occupation there. I, I mean, except going back centuries, really, but it, it's completely different. How would it work? Let me ask, answer the first question first. So uh, public opinion polls in Palestine, this is before October 7, but, this, uh, but in 2023, found actually support for the one-state solution is surging. Two states, some people still support an independent Palestinian state, to be sure, but more and more Palestinians in the West Bank, Gaza and East Jerusalem, along, I might add, with the diaspora, who have also, in my view, an equal right to their view, do not accept the idea of a separated state for practical reasons and ideological reasons. Uh, because practically speaking, there are now 750,000 Israeli settlers in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. They're not going anywhere. Israeli governments, whether Netanyahu or someone else, there is a, an addiction to occupation within Israel. And ideologically speaking, the idea of a state that ignores or at least shuns nationalism, the idea of a one-state solution is not to imagine utopia. This is not a utopian idea by any means. It's important to note that the idea of a shared state is not new. It's been around mm. for a very, very long time. And public support within Palestine is growing. There's no doubt within Israel itself, it's relatively low. But as we talk about in the book, and there are many chapters in there from people like Sarah Roy and Gada Kami and huge numbers of other influential writers, Jewish and Palestinian from around the world, they're talking about practical steps of achieving that, decolonization, something akin to a truth and reconciliation conference that happened in South Africa after the end of apartheid. And it's important to note, during the apartheid era in South Africa, white South Africans said, there is no way we can have one state. There'll be essentially ethnic cleansing of us, of white people. Now, South Africa today is not utopian. There are huge problems there, to be sure. But apartheid ended in 1994. It's one state. Uh, Northern Ireland, Yeah, I mean, example. that's that's another interesting parallel, though, because people will argue now, in the case of Palestine and Israel, the level of violence in the even recent, very recent history we're talking about right now would never allow uh, for, for these two populations really to coexist. I mean, even if the arguments make sense in theory, human behavior sure. just really doesn't make much sense. And people will hold on to the grievances even for centuries. They will seek revenge. No one is claiming, and Ahmed and I and our contributors are not suggesting that a one-state solution means that grievances end tomorrow. No one's suggesting that Palestinians and Israeli Jews live together in every single home in Israel and Palestine, or whatever the state is called. No one's suggesting that, including us. We're talking about imagining what that possibility might look like. These chapters in this book talk about everything from understanding how to deal with the right of return, how to decolonize how to deal with grievances, how to deal with violence, how to deal with the mass violence that we're seeing now. And there's no doubt for many of us, Ahmed and I included, what's happened since October 7, the mass devastation in Gaza, causes all of us pause. There's no way to get around that. We're not sort of putting this on the table as an idea, which again comes in the long history of others who have done so before. But it's more putting on the table of saying we are constantly sold in the West and, frankly, much of the world, the European nations, the US and otherwise, that the two-state solution is the only way forward here, despite the Israeli government opposing it. What we're saying is why is that still viewed in the media and much of the political space as more viable than one state? A two-state solution will not happen. Mm. So why is it not possible to imagine a state where communities may well live separately for a while? I'm not denying that. They probably will. And after what happened on October 7 in the aftermath, that's even more likely. But the possibility of decolonizing is vital for that place to ever have a chance of peace. Mm. It, it, tell me, Anthony, you, you talked about surging support among Palestinians, and we know there are Israelis who support this as well. Mm. Who else backs this outside of Israel that is in a powerful or influential position? 
Well, the political elites in general don't. I'm not denying that. And, of course, one of the things that we're trying to do by this book and talking about this is to make it seen as more palatable. Because, as I say, one of the things we talk about in the book a lot is to challenge the concept of why two states continues to be put forward by US administration, virtually every European government, and many other governments in the global south, for that matter, as the solution, when, practically speaking, it will not happen. There is right mm. now no massive global influential leader who says a one-state solution. However, however, you do have growing numbers of European officials, not leaders, but officials saying, if two states will not happen because of endless Israeli colonisation, what is the next step? There really is only two options that Israel has as the more powerful actor here. There is one state now. It's an apartheid state. So that is one so-called solution or a democratic state. And one of the things we're really trying to talk about here is trying to convince or discuss with both Jewish and Palestinian communities that hardline nationalism is not the solution here. And I'm, not, I'm saying this as someone Jewish. I'm not just talking to a Jewish community. I'm talking to a Palestinian community as well. Particularly young Palestinians under occupation are increasingly supporting the idea of a one-state solution, not because they okay. want to live next to Jewish settlers, but that view is growing massively in the last 10 years. Okay. Anthony, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. Really, thank you so much uh, for joining us, as always, on this edition of thank The Newsmakers. So. And thank our viewers as well for being with us. Remember, you can follow us on X, and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.